Morning report at rnz.co.nz. You can also get in touch, as lots of you are this morning, on all, a whole bunch of subjects, actually. Hopefully we'll get some get some of your feedback a bit later on. Uh, text us on 2101 to get your korero into us. And on Twitter, you can also follow us at NZ Morning Report. We love getting your feedback, so do get in touch with us here at Te Reo Irirangi o Aotearoa. Mo New Zealand, you're listening to Morning Reports on RNZ National. Looking around the motu, it's a rainy day for Te Ikao Maui, but there will be fine weather in Te Waipo Namu, the south. Call Susie Ferguson, tēnei. At the Marie Kōr Corandan, tēnei, in this hour, yes, we'll have details of the government's major shake-up of the health system. Security analyst Paul Buchanan calls for stronger regulations for private investigators. Also before nine, we'll bring you the verdict of the Derek Chauvin murder trial in, well, it's about half an hour's time. Controversy is brewing over Rocket Lab's work at the Mahia Peninsula, and the Navy's newest and largest ever ship makes the first visit to its ceremonial home, New Plymouth. RNZ News at eight o'clock. Moa Thero. I'm Nicola Wright. A former SIS officer caught spying on Christchurch quake. Kati ki ora tātou. Tēnā tātou uh, e ngā hoa. Uh, ko whakawhaiti mai nei tēnei ata, runga i te karanga o tēnei kaupapa nui. Uh, e hono nei tātou nei tēnei rangi. Nō reira, hei tīmata tanga, ka tukuna atu te arawhata ki tō tātou kaihanga, mana nō tātou e arahi rotu a tātou whiringa o tātou kōrero e tēnei ata, nō reira mino e tātou. E hono re kroori ki te rungarawa maumarongo te whinua whakaaro pai ki ngā tāngata katoa anu. Nō re re pā e tō mātou matu i te rangi, e nei mātou opononga e tuahu nei mua tō aroaro. Te tiwhaka moi me tiwhaka whetai ki a koe mau mana ki tanka tō aku nei kuru ki a mātou. Nō re re pā ki noe te mātou ki a koe ki a tono he tō mai rangi o tō atawhai ki runga ki a mātou e wānanga nei nei koe papa ki e mui a mātou. A re hina mātou i roto i a mātou kōra rungi te tika te pono te mārama tangata nga kau whakaiti. Nō re re ki noe te mātou i noe ki a koe rungi te ingoto tami hukuraiti tō mātou kau whakaora, tō mātou kau awao, amini. 
koe noa hika mātou nga koutou. Uh, tuatahi ki te mihiaki, uh, ki te tiwi kāinga o tēnei takiwa o tēnei tarawahi taranaki i whānui, uh, ki te mihiaki, ki o koutou. Mena ki nei i a mātou i tēnei ata. Uh, tuarua, uh, ki o koutou katoa ko haramai tawhiti, ko haramai tata, tēnei rawātu koutou whaifukāro nei ki tēnei kaupapa i tēnei rangu. Haramai, uh, i roto i ngā tini aho tango te wāpapa ki nei i a tātou, uh, tēnā tātou i a tātou tini aitua, tātou tini mate, te pūkaho o rātou. Uh, hoa no, ko te kororo a tātou mātua tīpuna, uh, ke tuku nā atu rātou ke o kioki, ta ki o ki a tātou me ki ngā urupā o rātou mā, tēnā koutou ki o rā tātou. Tēnā ho ki tātou na i ngā kaupapa nui, uh, ki te mihiaki, uh, ki ngā minita, te kāhui minita, uh, ngā take hauora i tēnei rangi, uh, reira, ka nui te mihi ki a koutou, ki a tātou e tau nei, tēnā koutou ki o rā tātou. Uh, my name is Te Rau Kupenga, it's my absolute uh, delight to MC this morning, and before we get into the formalities, uh, and I'm going to invite Minister uh, Little and the Associate Minister for Health, um, Takotuakana, uh, Pini Henare, shortly, uh, but I just have to go through a quick safety briefing. Whānau, if we can please follow the instructions of Parliament's security staff at all times, they're here to keep us, indeed all of us, safe. Uh, should the fire alarms and evacuation message sound, then please evacuate via the same route that you entered into the building or via the nearest safety exit. Fire wardens will uh, guide you to the evacuation meeting point, uh, which is the forecourt just out the front. In the event of an earthquake, uh, drop, cover and hold on to something or someone. Uh, but hold until the shaking stops. Please keep away from the windows uh, and other obvious hazards if you can and remain inside the building and await instructions from our security staff. If anyone suffers a medical emergency, please know that Parliament has special procedures to coordinate quickly with the emergency services. So refrain from dialing 111 uh, and instead notify your nearest security and venue staff member. And there's a number uh, of our security staff and venue staff surrounding us this morning. Now, on arrival, you would have uh, been issued with a visitor's sticker. Please wear that sticker and ensure it is clearly visible at all times. Uh, now, our Farepaku bathroom facilities, there are some up here to my right. Uh, George Reedy, left, your left. Uh, so that's to my right over here. Reception area downstairs also has some. Uh, our health champions, oh, you're all health champions. So please know that parliamentary buildings and the grounds are smoke free. Uh, the use of e-cigarettes is also prohibited. Now, I know we all want to hear the court at all, so before we get into uh, the main announcements, can we please just check our phones one more time uh, to ensure that they are switched to silent? <coughs> Thank you. And while you're holding your phones, it's okay to take selfies and photos in this part of the venue, uh, but for security reasons, we can't take photos elsewhere in the parliamentary precinct. Now today we're also joined by journalists uh, who will scrutinise and report on the announcement. Please be mindful not to impede uh, their cameras and be aware of the cords and the cables that are on the grounds, that on the ground. So thank you for your attention and, and uh, paying particular attention to the safety briefing. We now come to the formalities. Uh, we're here to have the Health Minister, the Honourable Andrew Little, and the Associate Health Minister, the Honourable Penny Henade, make a significant announcement about Cabinet's decision regarding the health and disability sector. It's great to see you all here today, and thank you all for travelling, particularly those of you who have come from afar, uh, to hear uh, these reforms in relation to the health and disability sector here today. I'd also like to say a particular kia ora uh, to those of you who are tuning in via Facebook uh, live stream. May I also acknowledge members of Parliament uh, from across the House who are here. Uh, there's representatives from every elected party who have been invited to this week. From the MPs, can I pay a particular uh, uh, acknowledgement to uh, the Honourable Carmel Sipaloni, Minister for Disability Issues in ACC, as well as the Honourable Opito William Sewell, uh, Associate Minister of Health Pacific, uh, and the Honourable Dr Aisha Verrill, uh, the Associate Minister of Health with particular responsibility for public health. Very shortly, I will invite uh, the Honourable Andrew Little to the stage. Now, uh, Andrew Little has served as Minister of Health since November 2020. And Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's government, Andrew also serves as Minister Mungatake Tiriti, 
uh, that's Treaty of Waitangi negotiations, the Minister for, responsible for NZSIS and GCSB, and the Minister responsible for Pike re, uh, River Reentry and Lead Coordination Minister for the Government's response to the Royal Commission's report into the terrorist attack on the Christchurch mosques. As you will see, an important part of this announcement relates to Māori health, or haura. At the appropriate time, Minister Little will invite his colleague, uh, the Honourable Penny Henare, to the stage. As well as Associate Minister for Haura, Minister Henare serves as Minister of Defence, Final Order, Associate Minister for Housing and Tourism, and is also uh, currently the Acting Associate Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage as well. Now, after the ministers have spoken, they'll briefly exit for a stand-up uh, with the media. The ministers will then return for an informal mix and mingle with you all, and a chance for you, really, to share your feedback uh, before wrapping up at 9am, so 55 minutes or so. On your way out, printed materials uh, for you to take away will be available downstairs where you came in. Uh, these will also be available on the DPMC website, dpmc.govt.nz, uh, and through a link from the Ministry of Health website. So, without further ado, please join with me in welcoming the Minister of Health, the Honourable Andrew Little, to the stage. Morena tata katoa, tēnā tātou kua karahui hui mai nei i tēnei ata, ki te whakarewa, te rau taki hauora mātua o Aotearoa, ki o hua ko te oranga, pai e te motu, tēnā tātou katoa. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And thank you very much uh, for joining me and my colleagues, Aisha, Penny, and Opito, for this very important announcement. I should say that uh, in preparing for this event, we issued about 400 invitations and we've had over 600 replies. So <laughs> we might have found a new magic way of reducing the DHB deficits. I'm not quite sure. Today, I'm laying out for you a plan to create a truly national public health service. A system that takes health services to the people who need them, no matter who they are or where they live. That draws on the best of what we have now, but means doctors, nurses and other health workers can concentrate on patients instead of battling bureaucracy. <laughs> that takes the pressure off overstretched hospitals by treating people before they get so sick that they need, need to go to hospital. And that gets rid of the postcode lottery where the type of treatment you get is determined by where you live. We all know the pressure our hospitals and specialist services are under. And it's largely because people are not getting the health care they need when they need it. And because people are living longer and developing more complex health issues. By making the changes I am announcing today, we will have the chance to put the emphasis squarely on primary and community health care. We will have the chance to do away with duplication and unnecessary bureaucracy between regions so that health workers can do what they do best, heal people. And by making these changes, we can start giving true effect to Tino Rangatiratanga and our obligations under Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And I'll speak more about this soon. Some of you were here last month when I set out the case for change. As I said then, health services touch all our lives. While our current system has many strengths, our good overall results disguise real issues of access and inequity. Earlier this week, the Health Quality and Safety Commission released a report showing that if you're a young Māori who has suffered major trauma, you are three times more likely to die in the following month than other young people who have suffered the same injuries. Māori and Pacific peoples are twice as likely to die, from, die young from conditions that could have been treated, and being Māori or Pacific even determines what sort of treatment you get. People with severe mental health issues die up to 25 years earlier than others. And if you're disabled, well, don't, we don't even know what's happening with you because we don't gather enough information. These facts are in part the consequence of a system that is disjointed and that simply does not see the needs of large parts of the community. 
It's also a system under stress. Our health, care, our health and care workers strive every day to provide the best possible care for their patients. But demand is growing. Patient needs are getting more complex and the job is getting harder. It hasn't been helped by nine years of underfunding by the previous national government. By contrast, the Labor government is spending more money on health care than ever before. But even the extra $5.6 billion for health in last year's budget alone has not been enough to make up for years and years of underinvestment. The Health and Disability System Review, and I acknowledge Heather Simpson, who chaired that review, who's here today, was commissioned nearly three years ago to set a direction for reforming our health system. I'm very grateful for the work of the Independent Review for its detailed analysis, careful consideration and clear direction for reform. The Review's recommendations have greatly influenced the Government's thinking. Many of you were part of the Review's extensive consultation and supported the consensus it built on the need for change. I have heard your desire for change to happen quickly. Over the past few months, the Health and Disability Review Tra uh, Transition Unit within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and I have been working at pace to come up with a plan for the future. This work has focused on the core objectives for the health and disability system and the functions that need to change to set the foundation for improving care for all. It has concluded, as have I, that the current system no longer serves our needs well. Our goal is a health system that helps all New Zealanders to live longer, in good health, and have the best possible quality of life. Health is the second biggest spend by the government today, with 20 cents in every dollar going towards it. Health will always be a priority for this government, but spending on health can never be unlimited. <coughs> so we need a system that is not only fairer, but also smarter. Fairer so that it tackles inequity, inconsistent access, and differing levels of service to give every New Zealander consistent quality health care. Smarter so that it works effectively, intelligently, cohesively, and makes the most of the money and resources available. I don't underestimate the challenge it will take to achieve this. Last month, I described five system shifts to ensure we have a health system that serves everyone. Firstly, that the health system reinforces Te Tiriti principles and obligations. Next, all people will have access to a comprehensive range of support in their local communities to help them, help them stay well. Next, everyone will have access to high quality emergency or specialist care when they need it. Next, digital services will provide more people with the care they need in their homes and communities. And finally, health and care workers will be valued and well trained for the future health system. Here is how we will achieve this. We will build a single, truly national New Zealand health service. Our system has become overly complex. It is far too complicated for a small nation. We simply do not need 20 different sets of decision makers. Nor do we need 20 plans for capital investment, for IT systems or for our workforce. It leads to duplication, variability and inefficiency. It forces too many artificial barriers between regions, between professionals and between populations. What it doesn't do is allow us to focus on the needs of the New Zealand population and the system as a whole, or to identify and spread good ideas. Our response to COVID-19 saw the system forge a spirit of collaboration, but this is seldom how we operate in normal times. To change this dynamic, we need a fundamental shift in ethos and culture in the way we organise health services. We need to operate as one system. It means that organisations working together should be the norm, not the exception. It means simplifying and consolidating functions. 
and it requires common leadership to create a single, truly national New Zealand public health service with a unifying purpose to achieve pai ora, good health for all. There are four key parts to the changes I'm announcing today. Firstly, in relation to the Ministry of Health. We will improve the way the health system is overseen and reports to the public. A strengthened Ministry of Health will be responsible for advising the government and monitoring the performance of the public health system. It will set the strategic direction and develop national policy, and it will be responsible for regulation and ensuring financial stability. The Ministry will continue to be headed by the Director-General, who will remain the head of the health system. Statutory roles, such as the Director of Public Health and Director of Mental Health, will remain with the Ministry. The Ministry will monitor overall system performance, hold organisations to account for delivery, and support the Minister to intervene where necessary. However, the Ministry will no longer directly fund and commission health services. Instead, it will be leaner, sharper, more agile, and focused on its core role. The second element, Health New Zealand. The job of running our hospitals and commissioning primary and community health services will fall to a new Crown entity, Health New Zealand, or Health NZ for short. And I should add that the names of these intended organisations are working titles only. There's still a lot of work to do. There will be some consultation and no doubt ideas about alternative names. Health NZ will replace the existing 20 district health boards to become our first truly national public health service. DHBs have served their communities well for 20 years, but having separate organisations and competing priorities has led to unacceptable variability in health services. That is, the type of treatment you get can come down to where in the country you live. That's why it's become known as the postcode lottery. And in a country as small as New Zealand, we just don't accept it. I want to stress that this reform is about doing better with what we have. It's not about cutting services or closing hospitals, nor is it about cutting valuable frontline staff. We owe it to our incredible health workforce to have a system that creates an environment in which they can feel supported and well-led and gives them certainty about their future. A single Health NZ organisation will allow for true national planning for our workforce. It will allow us to start investing in and building the workforce we need for the future. It will monitor the performance of health services and drive improvement and innovation. We will be able to plan for things like IT systems that talk to each other, for capital investment, procurement and other issues that benefit the whole health service and we will do this while retaining local knowledge and focus. Health NZ will operate on the basis of four regions but it will also have district offices throughout the country which will ensure it is truly in touch with the needs of all New Zealanders. Each of the four regional divisions of Health NZ will be responsible for overseeing and managing a network of hospitals and commissioning primary and community care services in their region. Health NZ will take a nationwide system approach, but importantly, it will also delegate authority to that localised level so frontline health workers and communities have a real say in decisions about the health services that they need. This is not just about replacing 20 separate systems with one. It is about building a system that genuinely operates in a national way. The third element I'm announcing today is the Māori Health Authority. The system must work in true partnership with Māori to improve services and achieve equitable health outcomes. Māori still suffer, on average, worse health than other New Zealanders. I referred earlier to the report released this week by the Health Quality and Safety Commission. It makes for sobering reading and totally contradicts our perception of ourselves as an egalitarian country. The system has never allowed Māori meaningful control over issues affecting their own communities and has never really acknowledged 
that what we are doing isn't working for Māori and that by giving more control over to Māori communities, we might actually change things for the better. The Crown has specific obligations to Māori under Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Now we have the opportunity to truly live up to the vision of the treaty. As well as monitoring the state of Māori health and helping develop health policy as contemplated by the Health and Disability System Review, we will have a Māori health authority with the power to directly commission health services for Māori and to partner with Health NZ in other aspects of the health system. The establishment of the Māori Health Authority is a real step towards tenoranga tiratanga in health. And at this point, I want to hand over to my colleague Pen Henari, who's been doing much of the mahi on this area and engaging with the Māori community. Pen. Akati te nā tātou katoa e te tuakana nā uto tātou hui hui ngai whakarite ki oku hoa mahi e te minita, kāti ki a tātou te nā kutu katoa. We talk about being a transformational government. Some imagine this statement means big infrastructure builds, massive policy commitments, all leading up to a single grand reveal. But this is what I see as transformation. Something quite simple and yet so very complex. Māori feeling comfortable and able to go to the doctor when they are sick. That, and that alone, would change everything for our people. Our nannies would stop refusing to get their sore feet checked, even though it's been bothering them for a month. Mums wouldn't have to ration out their boys' antibiotics because their GP is an expensive one-hour drive away. Thousands of whānau would no longer get their diagnosis too late, too late to make a difference, too late to save a life. We would no longer hang in there, wait it out, or tell ourselves, I'll see how I feel in the morning, only to see the morning never come. Many Māori don't like going to the doctor, and it's not because we don't care about our health or the health of our whānau. It's because our experiences of the health system, the experiences of our parents and grandparents, have been a negative one. That is why we must change. That is why we must transform our Māori health system. Māori must be enabled to provide effective leadership and partnership throughout the health system as described by the Minister already. And we will require all organisations to share the responsibility for improving outcomes for Māori people. We will legislate for a new body and independent voice, the Māori Authority. This authority will drive Hauora Māori and lead the system to make real change. It will have, as the Minister described, joint decision-making rights to agree national strategies, policies and plans that affect Māori at all levels of the system. It will work in partnership with Health New Zealand to ensure service plans and commissioning drives improvement in equity across the board. It will be able to directly commission services and to grow kaupapa Māori services and innovation. The Māori Health Authority will be constituted to represent the Māori voice from all iwi and all Māori communities. Embedding partnership must also happen at a local level. Māori will have a clear voice in decision-making through the evolved iwi Māori partnership boards that will approve priorities and service plans for locality. We know transforming our health system won't happen overnight, but this is where we make a start. This is, for me, what transformation looks like. There is an old Māori whakatauki that says, ka pō, ka ao, ka awatea, ko tēnei te rā. Tis night, tis daybreak, this is our day. Kia ora, ngā mihi ki akwe, pini. The fourth element of the announcement today is in relation to public health. COVID-19 reminds us that public health is a critical part of our health and disability system. Population and public health present some of the largest opportunities to address inequity, tackle the causes of health need and manage future demand. It's why we are committed to creating a public health agency. The Public Health Agency will be located inside the Ministry of Health 
and will lead public health strategy, policy, analysis and monitoring. It will be the authority on public health knowledge in the system. It will monitor threats to our health and ensure we are ready to deal with them. As well as the agency, there will also be a new National Public Health Service within Health NZ, comprising the 12 public health service units across the country. The National Public Health Service will commission public health programs and will provide services that protect and improve the health of the population. An essential element of this service will be national, regional and local health promotions, particularly in communities with the greatest health needs. The Health Promotion Agency will be part of Health NZ and will work closely with the Māori Health Authority. There are other equity challenges as well. While we have specific obligations to Māori, discharging our moral duty to provide health services equitably does not stop there. The system must listen to the voice of Pacific people, disabled people, rainbow and diverse people, and all users of the health system, and design and deliver services that work for them. The, real the reality is that local elections for representatives to DHBs have not guaranteed we hear voices that represent the diversity of our communities. We can and must do better. Our reforms will give users of health services more ways to influence the system. Health NZ will be required to involve users of health services in its planning and to explain how it has done so. A new national consumer forum will champion the voice of health service users and pool the knowledge and expertise of existing bodies. We will prioritise improving health of Pacific peoples. We will develop a new national strategy for Pacific health focused on achieving health outcomes and the La Langa Fau goals. And we will similarly ensure Health NZ has the capability to develop and deliver a national health plan for Pacific peoples. And I acknowledge the work of Opetro William Seal, one of my other Associate Health Ministers, in his work in this area. One of the criticisms I have heard of the HDSR review is that it did not adequately address the concerns and needs of the disabled community. As I have said previously, we understand the difficulties in having disability support services treated solely as a health issue. They are not. Disability issues span the full range of social issues that any community faces. That's why I have more work being done in this area and I expect to be able to tell you more on that in September this year. Let me turn now to technology. An area long overdue for attention is the use of digital tools in health. In the structure I am announcing today, people will have better access to services with greater innovation and digital options, bringing services closer to home than ever before. For decades, we have talked about investing in community care, encouraging preventative health care, and shifting the focus away from hospitals. Consumers have repeatedly asked for the ability to use modern technology, such as virtual diagnostic tests at home, the ability to book doctor's appointments online, and digital monitoring of health conditions. To put it plainly, successive governments have simply failed to deliver in this area. With a truly national health service, we can deliver on this promise, setting common standards and improving access, while tailoring services to meet local needs and cutting unnecessary trips to hospitals and clinics. We will also strive to make sure that all New Zealanders, no matter where they live, will have access to the same level of health care. On top of that, communities will be able to develop services specific to their needs. Health NZ will work with communities, iwi Māori partnership boards and locality networks to develop the priorities for their areas, making sure people have a say in the services they get and how they use them. Services will be integrated and linked so people don't have to share the same information time and time again and will find it easier to get support from different parts of the health system. With appropriate safeguards in place, you should be able to turn up anywhere in the health system and know that the health professional seeing you has access to relevant health information about you. One of the great challenges of the next 20 years 
will be ensuring our workforce can tackle the complex needs of an ageing population at a time of global shortages. Our reforms will help us to plan and develop the health workforce we need for the future. A key element in creating a new culture will be a new New Zealand health charter designed with health and care workers to set down the values and principles of the national system. We will start work on this soon. The sort of change I've described today will not all happen overnight. Some aspects will take years, not months. Again, I do not underestimate the task we've got in making transformation of this size. There are two challenges right now that I want to acknowledge. The challenge of making change when we are also in the middle of a pandemic and dealing with a vaccination program, and the challenge of taking the next step. On the first, I am confident we can make these critical structural changes to the health system while keeping our frontline health workers focused on the COVID-19 response, just as we must keep our hospital emergency departments and operating theatres running. To those who say we should not be doing this now, I say that every week we delay is another week of people unnecessarily missing out on the health care they need, of continuing inefficiency, of continuing inequity. COVID-19 is not a reason to, prefer, to preserve a system that is not fit for purpose. On the contrary, we have seen what the system can achieve when it operates as one, when 20 DHBs work as a single nationwide health system. That's exactly what we want the current reforms to do. I'm mindful we need to progress carefully and not disrupt day-to-day -day health services. No one should miss out because the system was distracted by change. Maintaining services, including the COVID-19 vaccination program, will be a priority during the transition. But we must move forward deliberately and with determination. I expect the new system to come into effect in July 2022. Today is the start of the transition. So what happens next? In coming weeks, work will start on establishing interim versions of Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority as temporary agencies. They will work on designing the detailed functions, models and relationships of the new entities, while legislation is drafted to reflect their final forms and functions. I will appoint acting chief executives and independent committees over the coming months to advise on the development of each organisation and to support a smooth handover to the new entities once they've been established in law. Permanent appointments will be made early in, in, in the early part of next year and I expect the necessary legislation to be passed by the end of April next year. We will engage with Māori on the governance of the Māori Health Authority and how the authority operates. And we will engage with the health sector, those of you who come from the health sector and your representative organisations on design and implementation. Together, we have an opportunity to make a once in a lifetime change to put in place a new system and to improve the health of this and future generations. It is more important than ever that those of us leading the change for tomorrow do not compromise the care we give today. While we are in this transition, existing responsibilities will remain in place. DHBs will continue in their current roles and their leadership will be critical to managing a safe and effective passage to the new system. What I have announced today represents a dramatic change for our health and disability system. I want to reassure New Zealanders that the care they rely on will still be available. Your GPs, your local pharmacists and midwives and hospitals and specialists will all continue to provide the care as they do today. These reforms are about a smarter, fairer national health system. They're not about cutting spending or reducing the workforce. We need greater investment in health, not less, and more, not fewer people working in our future health system. The reform system will need to harness all the best skills and talent across current organisations. But we do need to strengthen how the system works, improve decision making, and reduce fragmentation and bureaucracy. This is a transformation 
that is necessary and overdue. This time, it must be different. If we are to achieve priority, to improve health and well-being, and to tackle inequity once and for all, we need to take these steps to reshape our system and give it the best chance of success. And with transformation and investment, and working together, we can ensure our system is one truly fit for future generations. I want to conclude with just a few words of my own. That as I have worked with the transition unit and my colleagues and others, putting together the details of this announcement over the last few months, I have been mindful of two things. I have been mindful of those working in the system as it is at the moment, who are working under increasing pressure and with increasing challenges. I think of the New Zealanders who go to their doctor, sometimes can wait days and weeks for an appointment. I think of those who go to our, our hospitals. I think of the father of the infant boy sitting on the theatre operating table getting the planned care that has been arranged for some time, knowing the fear and anxiety that goes with that, not just in the boy but in the father as well. And you look at those health professionals and they are heroes. And our health professionals are heroes. And I know, I've been that father and one of the heroes that I looked at on that day is in this room today. But I think of other, another group of people as well. And they are the ones who are missing out. The ones who, as Penny Hinari said, don't think about going to the doctor because the experience is too hard. The experience of their parents and forebears is too hard. We have to change that. We have to change that. We are a small nation, and we can make this change working together. We can make this change in the spirit of Te Tiriti. The announcements I've made today set down a challenge for the system, but actually for the nation as a whole. And it is time for us, I think, to rise to the challenge, to do better than we're doing, not just about health care, but about well-being, keeping us all safe and well. I look forward to the opportunity, and this is about opportunity, and there is huge opportunity. I and my colleagues, working with you, working together, through the hard times, to get to a new system, a transformed system, that serves the interests of all New Zealanders, wherever they are. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora no tātou. The Minister's uh, going to take leave for about five minutes or so, but please stay. Coffee, tea and breakfast are here. Uh, for those of you who do have to leave, there is a pack of printed materials out the front, though, which you can grab on the way out. But the Ministers will be back in a
there is, um, you know, you are still going to get these few cases that will slip through, no. even when people are using PPE, even, uh, you know, in that situation, we we have to expect this and, and hope, I guess, right. as it as it works its way through, that, that these vaccines do give a good level of protection against um, people who catch it, who are vaccinated, being able to give it to someone else. Oh, and she's gone. Helen Petusis Harris there. Uh, with a phone line that has just fallen over. It's 16 to 9. Still no verdict in on the Derek Chauvin case. The cameras are pointed at the stand uh, where the judge is due to come in shortly. We're still waiting. We'll bring that to you uh, as soon as it happens. Now, the Royal New Zealand Navy's newest and largest ever ship, the HMNZS Aotearoa, is making its first visit to its ceremonial home port in New Plymouth today. It is the Navy's newest and biggest ship. Our reporter, Robin Martin is on board. Hi, Robin. Yeah, good morning, Corin. How are you doing? Tell us what's the plan for today. This is a big occasion for the Navy. Oh, maybe we've lost Robin as well. Phone line, Gremlins. Oh, no, he's here. Carry on, Robin. Oh, yeah, OK. We're off uh, Port uh, Port Taranaki, and we're, we're just, we've just gone through the navigational uh, uh, briefing, and we're headed in there to dock at about about uh, 10 o'clock and uh, yeah like you say it's a big deal for this ship uh, New Plymouth is its um, ceremonial port um, so they're excited at connecting with with the port that they um, which they associate with and they try and draw some of their, their crew from and um, there'll be an open day on Saturday and they'll be taking part in um, Anzac um, Day celebrations as well while they're here. Now this is a pretty big ship 173 metres long tell us a little bit about it and what it will do. Well, it's it's uh, what they call a replenishing ship, which I think for you and I is a it's a form of, of tanker. So it can hold about um, 9,500 tons of uh, diesel fuel for other vessels. So it can it can refill frigates up to about 14 times. I'm told. Um, it can also hold 20 20 foot containers and has capacity to hold uh, an NH90 helicopter. So it can perform other uh, supply uh, operations while while out at sea and overseas. It can also um, produce 100,000 litres of uh, fresh water. They have a fresh water plant on, on board as well. So, yeah, it's got a few bells and whistles. So purpose built, obviously, that'll be very useful uh, throughout the Pacific, but also the Southern Ocean, I understand. It is a polar-class vessel. Yeah, look, um, it's got a specially designed hull, which um, can mean it can go down into the, uh, the Antarctic, and uh, an ice-breaking hull, I understand. Yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, Corin, I'm still recovering after getting out here on the inflatable rib, which uh, a young lady who's uh, one of the... Uh, like a recruit, uh, it's described as riding a horse. Uh, I don't ride horses very often, Corin. And You're not feeling... Very, are you feeling a bit ill? I, it was quite an experience, I can tell you. Well, I'm sure it's, well, hopefully it's a lot more stable and steady now that you're on uh, Aotearoa. Yeah, no, no, but uh, I'm standing on the deck now, fresh air, can see the horizon, feeling all ship shape and uh, dandy. Very good. Robin Martin there with an interesting experience this morning, heading out to the HMNZS Aotearoa, which is making its first visit to its, well, its ceremonial home, the port in New Plymouth. It's 13 minutes to nine. In INA, the 2021 Tate Music Prize was awarded at Auckland's Q Theatre last night. RNZ Music 101 presenter Charlotte Ryan was there and takes us through the winners. Last night, 10 of New Zealand's best independently released albums from the last year were vying for the prestigious Tate Music Award. This award celebrates independence and creativity, rather than album sales. The 2021 Tate Music Prize was awarded to Reb Fountain for her critically praised self-titled album released through Flying Nun. Tell me that you're crazy like my love Warm me like you're crazy like my love Love, kiss me like you're crazy, crazy for me, baby. And all the words are still in my mind. Rip Fountain's winning album was judged on artistic merit, songwriting, composition, production, originality, album artwork, the album's flow, and the emotion that it evokes. Don't you know? Don't you know who I am? 
Rib Fountain was awarded the heavy award and a cash prize of $12,500. You think of the calibre of the artist and, and it's my fellow nominees. Um, there was no way I thought I would take this home. <laughs> I can't believe it. I feel incredibly honoured. This award means a lot to me. I feel like it's recognition for the, the, the very challenging work that we do and at this time in our lives during COVID to be honoured in this way is, is really special. I feel like you have to push forward in this line of work. Like if we don't create our own work, we've, we don't get paid in six months time. The night was attended by 400 industry, media and musicians from all over Aotearoa and featured performances from last year's Tate Music Prize winner Troy Kingi and the Pautia Māori Club, who last night were awarded the Independent Classic Record Award for their 1983 single Poyer. The ceremony also included the presentation of the Independent Spirit Award, awarded to Pete Rainey and Glenn Common of Smoke Free Rock Quest for their contribution to New Zealand music. The Smoke Free Rock Quest began over 33 years ago and has become New Zealand's only nationwide live